Good afternoon, everyone. 5.31 uh, in Singapore, 4.31 in Bangkok. Maybe time to restart. We'll be back for the second round table of this uh, seminar on uh, the multidimensional approaches to the new bracket a regional order in the Indo-Pacific with views from Asia and the European Union. The second round table will focus more on the environmental issue before closing a remark by Prof. Alès. Um, and this session uh, will be chaired by uh, Kitty Nout, who very kindly uh, agreed and took time to be with us this afternoon. So thank you very much uh, for, for that. Uh, Kitty Nout is a qualified lawyer specializing in international environmental law. Uh, she's a senior consultant in clean, clean energy and climate change at the Create G. I don't know if I pronounced correctly, but it's a a business consultancy based in uh, Thailand, and uh, she's used to advise and work with uh, governmental agencies and international organizations on a major environmental uh, project. Uh, so please, Kitino, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric, for the introduction. I'll take it from here. Um, good afternoon everyone and good morning to some of you. The second round tables of today's webinar is about environmental issues. In the Indo-Pacific region or in Southeast Asia region, there are many environmental problems that are transboundary in nature, like climate change or marine plastic pollution, which means that there are not only regional but also global problems. Some problems are highly critical and can be considered as non-traditional security issue, like climate change and its severe impacts. The environmental issue is one of the key priorities of enhanced cooperation between the European Union, France, and the Indo-Pacific countries and regional organizations like ASEAN. Today, we have four speakers who have worked extensively on the environmental issues and the EU, the EU roles in the region. They will share with us today their works and perspectives on different dimensions of the problems. First, we have Professor François Gimène from Sciences Po Paris. He will address the issue of climate change adaptation and migration. Second, we have Professor Frederick Klein from RSIS, Nanyang Technological University. His topic is on the EU and member states' role in the increasingly competitive bipolarity of the Indo-Pacific. Next, we have Professor Jay Baton Bacal from the University of the Philippines. He will present marine environmental challenges in Southeast Asia. And finally, we have Dr. Le Tung Kian from the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. He will address how to have a transboundary water governance mechanism based on rules of law in the Mekong subregion. Each of you, my speakers, we have 10 minutes for the presentation. After the presentation is finished, we're going to um, initiate the discussion um, on the topic relating to the presentation. And then we'll, we'll give the floor to the audience to ask questions. Um, the session will run in this sequence, um, but with a small exception that um, I'm not sure if Professor Fung can join us today, uh, but we will leave the place for him in case he can join us later on. So um, let's begin with the first speaker, um, Dr. Frederick, Frederick Klein, the floor is yours. Hi. Uh, good evening from Singapore. Sorry, I, I didn't realize I was the first speaker. I thought um, I saw I, I thought I was the second, but uh, never mind. Yeah. Because, never mind. Uh, the first one is a professor from Sojimen, but um, we did not hear from him from for the moment. Okay, never mind. But then you all have to apologize uh, for I've just uh, stuck a fisherman friend in my mouth. So I hope you I hope you can't hear it thinking I had another 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, never mind. It's perhaps a good time, a, a good presentation to start with anyway, because I must admit that I'm not an expert in environmental uh, issues as such, right? What I study is uh, multilateralism, institutionalism and how it intersects with geopolitics and very specifically focused on, on Europe and Asia and how those these two regions intersect. So what I can provide here perhaps is some sort of structural and also policy relevant uh, background, a broad overview, I guess, for then the experts who on, on, on very specific environmental issues to, to come in. So um, uh, I do my very best to not bore you because 
some of you may have heard me speak in other uh, conferences and, and, and media uh, um, uh, outlets and so forth uh, before. And I've been making pretty much the same points for the past 20 years because structurally, uh, fundamentally, not much has changed. So um, I think I want to make sure that we all, that, that I can get across three main points here, right? One is that the European Union and Europeans in general are very limited in what they can do here uh, in the Indo-Pacific um, uh, region, how, what they can contribute. And I will say in a few minutes why that is the case. Um, I, I, my second main point is that we are with the end of the Asia Pacific and the advent of the Indo-Pacific, we're seeing a much more um, and we can, of course, conceptually discuss the Indo-Pacific, uh, if you like, in the Q&A. Um, but with the end of the Asia-Pacific and the beginning of the advent of the Indo-Pacific, we're seeing an increasingly competitive uh, bipolarity, a, 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 an increasingly uh, competitive polarization here of this region, uh, which is not in Europeans' interest and is also not in ASEAN's. Uh, interest uh, the region where I'm speaking from here today. So uh, the third point would that would be that nonetheless there is quite a lot the EU can add and uh, in spe specifically how the EU can work together with ASEAN on a number of issues and I will focus here uh, specifically on environmental and green issues as this is the the uh, purpose of this of this panel right. So my main proposal really is that um, and in fact, this is not a new point. I've been making this point for, for many, many years. The European uh, Union and in fact, uh, Europe, France is slightly different here with having citizens in this region that uh, uh, are subject, of course, to French protection. Nonetheless, uh, uh, fundamentally, the main argument remains the same that the European Union and Europeans should not get engaged militarily here in this region, should really concentrate on softer issues where um, Europe has its strengths. Um, in particular on those issues that may fall victim to an increasingly uh, polarized region. And those issues are those softer issues, specifically in the environmental space, but also when we talk about infrastructure development uh, and, and, and so forth. So structurally, I guess there is, I, I just indicated uh, that there is an increasing polarization. I would call this malign bipolarity, right? The Indo-Pacific is pretty much the unraveling of everything the Asia Pacific was, which is, uh, a closer cooperation, an emphasis on multilateralism, uh, the, the, the promises and the perils of economic interdependence uh, theory, right? Uh, uh, manifested in, for example, institutions like APAC and in mushrooming multilateralism and increasing uh, uh, um, regional interdependence. And the Indo-Pacific is pretty much the unraveling of all of this. And this is driven uh, predominantly, of course, by the so-called Quad nations uh, with America, of course, at the forefront, but also including uh, Japan, Australia, Australia and India. These Indo-Pacific notions that are promoted by these countries, by these Quad countries, are essentially exclusive minilateral clubs. And uh, uh, those of you who, like myself, believe in the value of multilateralism and the promises of multilateralism must uh, be concerned by mushrooming mi uh, minilateralism here in this region because it displaces uh, multilateralism, is indeed hostile uh, uh, to it. So um, especially Europe that has had such amazing transformative experiences with multilateralism uh, should be uh, concerned about this and should be uh, prim prim primarily seeing multilateralism as a vehicle to promote regional, uh, regional cooperation, right? So, and this increasing minilateralism exclusive, of course, we all have China in mind, in all but name, this is exactly what the Quad is and, and the free and open Indo-Pacific is about. Um, um, there is a real possibility that certain issues will fall victim to binary block competition, right? So short of great power war, which I think we all hope uh, will not happen. Nonetheless, uh, um, I must admit that since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I don't think we can rule out anything anymore uh, with any great confidence. But nonetheless, uh, let us hope uh, uh, we remain short of great power war here in this region. But nonetheless, the, the greatest risk here uh, short of this war is non-cooperative coexistence, right? So a situation where we have two sort of uh, two sort of a binary from a binary perspective, two sort of blocks that are peaceful uh, but non-cooperative, uh, uh, nonetheless. So that chokes multilateralism, of course. But I want to focus here specifically on functional cooperation. Non-cooperative block formation leads to a situation where it will be very very difficult 
to have an inclusive approach to dealing with issues such as climate change, uh, marine uh, protection of, of, of marine biodiversity, and so forth. All those issues, and, and, and you can literally name hundreds of issues, uh, all uh, in the so-called non-traditional security uh, basket of, 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 of uh, security threats, if you want to securitize this at all, softer issues, if you want a broader term, right? So all these things will fall victim eventually to non-cooperative blocks, because what we need here is we do need the United States, we do need the Quad Nations in general, and we do need China. So what we need here is inclusive approaches. And this is pretty much exactly what the European uh, Union uh, uh, strategy about the, for, for the Indo-Pacific is all about, right? It is about being slightly more inclusive, although it does take a more critical stance of China than individual uh, uh, European perspectives on, um, on the Indo-Pacific. Nonetheless, uh, it, it, it is more akin to ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which uh, uh, prescribes an inclusive framework, right? Uh, not taking sides in this great power competition and working with China as much as they work uh, with the United States, right? So what the European Union is really strong at and Europeans in general, and this is manifest both in the EU strategy for the Indo-Pacific, in the European uh, nations, individual strategies for the Indo-Pacific, but it is also manifest in the, in the ministerial conference, right, which is, which is one of our main uh, items to be discussed here today, is uh, uh, those soft power and non-traditional security oriented agenda items, right? And in fact, if you look at the ministerial conference about these kind of items took up about two thirds of the entire conference, right? I think it was an item two connectivity and digital and three, they termed the global issues, which I thought was a bit of a misnomer, but not, never mind. We are talking here about those, uh, uh, those uh, softer issues, right? So what can be done very specifically uh, uh, here? Let me begin with uh, one limitation that sticks out to me. And this limitation is a relatively new thing. Um, it is born out of Europe's natural political uh, uh, geography, right? Uh, and, and, and of course, I here have Russia and the European neighborhood uh, for utmost in mind. Russia was, is, and remains the primary strategic concern of all Europeans, right? This should be pretty obvious by now to everyone, but it was also obvious before the Russian invasion, if you have read uh, carefully the strategic, the great strategies, if you want, the grand strategies of the individual nations, most of all, of course, of the United Kingdom, not member of the EU, nonetheless, a European country. Right? Russia is our primary concern. China and the Indo-Pacific at the very most uh, top three or top four concern for European unions. So if you combine this with uh, general resource limitations that always exist and that always must be, I'm a think tanker, uh, 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 most, most of all, so that must be at the forefront of all of us who advise and write and think about policy making concretely, right? So resource limitations always exist, so we need to prioritize. And um, if we are now looking at a reprioritization, perhaps, uh, in Europe, we need to uh, specifically stick to the phrase, play to your strengths, right? And military contributions are certainly not uh, Europe's strengths in any meaningful way anyway. But on items two and three of the ministerial conference, um, we also need to highlight that even there, European uh, uh, power is limited. And I give you a couple of examples. For example, <clears throat> we have what we call the peace facility, right? An, an instrument that was created off budget in order to, to facilitate European action, including in the security space uh, uh, around the world, right? We have now uh, um, used this peace facility now we, I say we, what I mean is the European Union has uh, 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 rep repurposed, I guess, this peace facility uh, with for Ukraine, right? In, in, in fact, um, uh, used already up, already hit the budget ceiling for the peace facility of this year, if I'm not mistaken, perhaps my European friends can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but I, uh, those, those are limitations that are born out of um, uh, a new, perhaps reprioritization um, on a factor that has always been there, but has, is now at the forefront of everybody's mind. Another issue would be the Global Gateway, which initiative, right? The Infrastructure Investment Initiative, which also uh, played quite a prominent role in the in the ministerial conference. And here, I would like to highlight that um, in the last at the last EU summit, the Council summit, um, it was pretty clear that um, um, a sizable uh, amount of effort by the European Union with regards to Ukraine will focus on hopefully very, very soon post-war reconstruction of Ukraine, right? They have set up what they call, or at least they're trying to set up the Ukraine, Ukraine Solidarity Trust Fund, right? Which, which will go towards rebuilding of Ukraine. So the Ukrainians ha have estimated, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere between 500 billion and 1 trillion for recovery from this war. And the longer the war drags on, the, more, the, the larger the sum will get. So 
all sizable Team Europe initiatives, which feature again quite highly in the ministerial conference, uh, will be affected by this uh, uh, to somehow, uh, to some extent. Money does not go on, grow on trees, right? So, and Europe will have to reprioritize uh, to some extent. So everything that you will do here in the Indo-Pacific has promised or what this region expect from the European Union will be to some extent affected by those uh, immense resource limitations. Nonetheless, I, I want to finish on a positive note uh, and, 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 and look at what, what the EU can really con contribute here, uh, 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 in, in my opinion. I think first here in this region, we need to redefine what we uh, understand as commitment, right? Here, especially in Southeast Asia, all uh, American commitment is stronger than European commitment and Japanese commitment is really strong, but it's also not quite up there. They have here in this region, in my opinion, a too narrow definition of what commitment actually is. We measure commitment here in this region too often in terms of security, right? Uh, the more ships sail in the region, the more committed you are. This is a very narrow definition of commitment. And I think if we take a more holistic approach to the definition of commitment, as I think we should do, then the European Union is very strong. And I've said it many times at many conferences before, and I'm never tired of repeating it. The European Union, to my friends here in the Indo-Pacific, the European Union is the only I underline and emphasize the only actor in this region that has no hidden agenda, that has a genuine interest in the prosperity, stability, development of this region. The only actor here in this region that does not just pay lip service to ASEAN and ASEAN centrality, but that actually means it. And that is born out of uh, our experience with multilateralism and regional integration, of course, uh, in Europe, which is born uh, of course, you can be critical of it in many ways, as I am uh, too, but has borne predominantly positive effects for European development and peace, of course, peace and stability at the very forefront of it. Once again, the EU is the only actor that has no hidden agenda. So when the European Union comes here to cooperate on certain issues, I think this should be here, especially from an ASEAN perspective, our first partner of choice. So there are several buckets of cooperation where we can think the EU can contribute and specifically uh, um, I, I think about trade, trade and multilateral institutionalism but with this uh, with this panel in mind I think I would uh, I think we should emphasize functional cooperation really on 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 on, on um, uh, environmental issues and I would like to highlight two specific things that I think are very important one is and of course, the European Green Deal uh, comes to mind uh, immediately, right? So we are talking here about an, a once in a generation opportunity to reset our economies post COVID. And the European Union has emphasized on numerous fronts that we will do so, but that we will in this uh, reset of our economies or in this further development of our economies, prioritize uh, gr the greenness of everything, pretty much everything we do, right? So emphasis, sustain, em emphasize sustainability uh, uh, in, in all um, uh, programs going forward that aim at economic uh, revival. And I think that this is something where uh, the Indo-Pacific region, ASEAN in specif specifically, uh, should be looking at very closely and should uh, should cooperate with the European Union. So um, uh, we're having uh, sustainability value, of course, added here substantially when we look at uh, uh, things like green investment uh, and sustainable finance, something where the European Union has a great deal of experience with and something here, especially here in Singapore, we are very, very interested uh, in exploring this, this topic too. Uh, creating green partnerships, right, for, for protecting biodiversity, uh, among other things, right? ASEAN has ratified in 2019, of course, I, I'm sure most of you will know the, the declaration on combating marine uh, pollution. I think this is an example where we can have, where we can create some sort of synergetic uh, uh, interregional engagement, uh, exchange of experts uh, support each other in terms of uh, research and development projects, right? Again, something that uh, was being discussed in the ministerial conference, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this uh, the, concentrating on those sort of issues, uh, on these sort of issues, can, can can significantly improve both regions, citizens, citizens' life, our our well-being. But importantly, it can also add economic uh, and sustainability value uh, here in, in in this region, right? So my final point would be uh, uh, in the bucket of interregional cooperation on the on the pandemic, and I have been following very closely the European Union's effort. Um, uh, to liaise with ASEAN on pandemic recovery. And I must say, I'm nothing short of, uh, uh, of being amazed what the uh, EU mission in the, to ASEAN in Jakarta is doing very specifically uh, under 
uh, under the, the new EU ambassador, not so new anymore, EU ambassador to ASEAN in terms of uh, 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 liaising on the pandemic, right? Having uh, webinars, of course, distributing funds, significant funds. Uh, one of the things I, nev I will never try to, um, I will never try, I will never tire of repeating is, uh, proving my point, in fact, that the EU is the only actor with no hidden agenda, is if you look at vaccine distribution, right? The European Union does not engage in vaccine diplomacy. The European Union distributes vaccine as it should be done via the COVAX facility, which ensures a, a basic degree of, of global equity, rather than distributing vaccines specifically to certain countries with a strategic uh, objective in mind, as many other countries do in the region. I hate to interrupt, but uh, could you please wrap it up? Okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, so calling the pandemic an, an, an environmental issue maybe some may, may, may sound a bit far fetched, but I think uh, it, it it is not too far fetched if you consider uh, um, if you consider um, uh, how pandemics how pandemics start and how pandemics spread. And I think uh, uh, as uh, even if we return to a sense of normalcy now, I, I think we would be naive to believe that this was the last pandemic. So I think th this is something where we can really add value uh, for the future cooperation between the EU uh, and the Indo-Pacific region in specifically, but once again, ASEAN as our natural partner of intersection. So just to wrap it up, uh, I think what we should be doing is we should not look at the Indo-Pacific so much in binary terms, uh, uh, China, the United States, even the Quad Nations as a, as, a, as, a, as a grouping. What we should be really doing is we should be looking at multilateralism first, right? So we should look, we should be looking at, 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 at uh, existing and functioning mechanisms mostly based on ASEAN and uh, look how to liaise there. And the second main point here of my presentation was that this should not focus so much on security issues unless they're in the non-traditional basket of security issues. Issues. And this is where we can really add value, uh, specifically with the European experience and expertise in mind, uh, what is demanded here in this region, but also uh, uh, what can be done uh, in the light of severe resource constraints that uh, exist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your contributions. Um, it's, it's a great presentation and, and I think we're definitely going to come back to discuss more on the issues you have raised. Um, but for now, let's move on to the next speaker, um, Professor Jay Batobakal. The floor is yours, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, conference. I'll be uh, straight to I'll go straight to the point uh, with respect to my presentations about the marine environmental challenges in Southeast Asia, and I guess I will uh, discuss this in a, on, on a theme of threes. No, uh, first off, uh, there are three I think uh, three most important. Uh, marine environmental challenges for Southeast Asia that the EU, EU can uh, probably is already aware of, but it's uh, also worth uh, emphasizing in every discussion. These uh, three challenges uh, I've sort of uh, put in the order of those, that, uh, one that unites, and uh, first is the, what unites, uh, as, tends to unite uh, Southeast Asia, and then, then it moves to those which divide. And these are briefly uh, marine plastics, climate change, and IUU fishing. Uh, we, on the first one, marine plastics, this is really a worldwide problem that has really come into prominence in recent years. And the UNEP has estimated that the amount of marine plastic or plastic trash basically in the oceans will double by 2030 and triple by 2040, which is well within our lifetimes. And for each and every one of us who has gone to the beach, this is uh, quite visible uh, to each and every person. Now, Southeast Asia is both a source and a victim of uh, plastic pollution. Uh, six of the 10 members generate 31 million tons of plastic waste, waste each year, and 80% of marine plastic debris uh, in the ocean can be traced back to land-based waste, which unfortunately within Southeast Asia is also fairly, uh, um, has a fairly, uh, there's a, uh, um, is, um, generates, uh, Southeast Asia generates a fairly large amount, and a lot of that goes into shared rivers, uh, or uh, sewers and congested metropolitan areas, and they, and and uh, it, it goes into the trash, which eventually uh, gets washed into the sea. Now, uh, ASEAN has recognized this uh, recently, you know, in just a few years, uh, which I guess uh, is an indication of how visible and important the issue has become. And there is already an ASEAN regional action plan for combating marine debris in ASEAN member states. You know, and this is to cover a period from 2021 to 2025. 
uh, and um, individual members, uh, member states of ASEAN have um, mostly come up with national roadmaps and plans of action for marine plastic pollution. But the key challenge here is that despite the, these are basically uh, plans and there is still, however, a, a huge lack of capacity around plastic waste management and in both the public and private sectors of all of these countries. And uh, ASEAN self-recognizes the need for innovation and capacity building on this. And there have been some um, projects that have been started like the between ASEAN and Norway. Uh, and there are also continuing talks on how to uh, implement uh, these plans and further refine them, uh, such as the ASEAN plus three uh, marine plastic debris cooperative action. And there are also uh, individual or bilateral projects with, such as those uh, with, with Japan against marine plastic litter. So that's a good sign that there is a need and, uh, and there's a, sorry, that there is a demand. And this is something I think that uh, uh, can be filled up, uh, that needs to be filled up urgently. Uh, also, another challenge is the role of the consumer. Um, uh, plastic waste is generated because of the consumer products that uh, uh, are, are on a daily basis being bought and, and disposed of. And the pandemic, uh, unfortunately, has brought about a reliance on services that actually have produced even more plastic. In the case of Manila, for example, I recall that in 2019, there were just uh, there was big news around uh, um, se several cities banning the use of single use plastics in supermarkets and in stores. But then the following year, because of the pandemic and the resort to uh, service uh, delivery services and online stores, all of a sudden, the usage of single-use plastics has, has magnified tremendously. And even the um, PPEs, uh, personal protective equipment that had to be uh, 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 that had to be used during the pandemic also ended up uh, washing ashore. And uh, just last year, uh, as uh, we opened up, uh, the news was all about um, um, the face masks being found uh, among the coral reefs. <laughs> and that's a really very sad uh, uh, development given the uh, interest in, in combating it as all of a sudden everything turns around and the pandemic simply makes it uh, impossible. Now, confounding this, uh, of course, for the entire region is that despite the intention uh, and, and uh, the unfortunate conditions, there is an, an, a really confounding and rather excessive framework of documents all around the same that it can be a real challenge just just working your way through these international statements agreements arrangements memorandums of understanding and all the different ASEAN forums with plus three plus five or whoever um so that uh, is is in itself a challenge in how to address this uh this problem which needs to be uh, um, um combated uh, immediately you no know, very urgently now, on the second point, climate change, this is actually connected to the plastics problem because plastics originate from fossil fuels uh, and they consume 6% of the oil production. And it has been thought and uh, determined that uh, this is actually going to increase to 20% by 2050, again, within our lifetimes. And the use of disposal of plastics uh, is therefore going to increase within that time. Uh, it has been estimated that uh, this, this activity uh, uses up uh, or, or generates uh, 1.7 gigatons of, uh, of a CO2 equivalent. And because of the rise in consumption or in disposal, then it will also rise to, again, to about 6.5 gigatons by 2050 and uh, will occupy 15% of the carbon budget of the world. So the addressing plastics pollution is necessarily connected with addressing uh, climate change issues. Now, Southeast Asia, as we know, is the most at-risk region for climate change impacts. Um, Vietnam, Myanmar, and the Philippines uh, are have been identified to be the most affected in the past 20 years. And uh, the, in, the, the effects of rising sea levels, heat waves, droughts, intensing, intensifying rainstorms and typhoons and flooding have been felt, uh, especially in recent years. It is thought that up to 96% of ASEAN will be affected by drought and 64% by very extreme drought. Uh, together with the cyclical uh, El Nino uh, oscillations. Uh, future sea level rise will affect large amounts of population, large numbers of the uh, coastal populations, uh, including the economies and infrastructure of ASEAN, which uh, is also largely coastal in nature. Uh, Indonesia's uh, decision to move its capital from Jakarta to Borneo is one very good example, I think, of how visible and, and real this impact is now. 
and millions will have been affected in the Philippines and Vietnam with each typhoon just in 2020 it was estimated that 5 million were were adversely impacted by a typhoon uh, during that year uh, UNEP or sorry ADB has estimated that climate change will uh, diminish the GDP of the region by 11 percent by the end of the century so that is uh, uh, quite uh, alarming and a most uh, important rice yields, you know, which is a staple in the region, a staple food in the region, could drop by as much as 50% you know, by the next century you know, compared to its production in 1990. And given that this region also uh, it stands among the most populous uh, in the world you know, uh, here in Asia, then that is an indication of a looming uh, crisis again. Uh, while most countries have pledged to uh, speed up their greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, emissions reductions in Southeast Asia, still uh, more needs to be done. A lot of it is on paper, and um, um, despite that, energy demand will continue to grow by as much as 60 percent by 2040. Again, it's a very near, uh, very short timeline. Uh, population growth and economic development and urbanization uh, will uh, prompt or will drive the increasing reliance on coal and fossil fuels, despite these plans now and right now despite these plans indonesia and the philippines are still set to increase their uh, coal uh, um, their resort to coal power plants in the for the coming uh, decades so it has been anticipated that the reduction targets will likely not be met and there will be delays uh, in shifting to uh, uh, to uh, more sustainable uh, energy uh, sources uh, more so, um, uh, the the pandemic no, uh, will require uh, pandemic recovery will require economic stimulus, which will probably further challenge uh, these plans for greenhouse gas reductions. And in the meantime, deforestation continues, especially in in the larger countries of Indonesia and Malaysia, because uh, the the economic development imperatives are are driving the the use of forests and conversion to pulp and paper and palm oil plantations instead. Now, on the last point, the last problem, IUU fishing, is again, is also connected because the reason why there is uh, IUU fishing, it's because of increasing demand for goods such as fish. And this is driven in turn by economic development plans and competition among the countries. So again, it uh, is related to the uh, continuing uh, emissions, uh, increasing emissions that cause climate change. At least 15% of the world's fish catch is caught, uh, is caught um, from, uh, by IUU fishing. And, and this is a huge amount. And despite the fact that uh, in 2016, the ASEAN members issued a joint declaration against IUU fishing, which indicates their awareness of the problem, uh, still, uh, uh, despite that, uh, a lot uh, uh, obviously needs to be done. Um, the regions uh, prone to, the, to IUUF uh, in, the, in this area are the Gulf of Thailand, Indonesian waters, Malaysian uh, waters, as well as the South China Sea, which is even more complicated because of the competing uh, um, um, claims to uh, territories and jurisdictions. And that's so, um, despite these plans and strategies, IUU fishing remains quite rampant uh, in the area. There are many documents, but unfortunately, ASEAN does tend to produce a lot of text, but lags behind in action. The case in point is uh, a China ASEAN declaration on a decade of marine environmental protection that was in 2017, and have yet to see the re a real concrete uh, um, um, outcome uh, or a concrete activity between them on this declaration several years later. Um, nonetheless, there is at least a lot of effort. There are regional plans of action against IUUF. There is a Coral Triangle Initiative. There is the ASEAN CFDEC partnership and all of these other uh, documents. But again, as I said, no, we have a lot of text, but uh, we lag behind in actually implementing that text. Maybe it's because people are too busy writing down the next batch of texts. Now, um, unfortunately also, the return on investments from IUU fishing tends to be still very, very high. Too many people are making so much money out of it. And um, vast areas of waters combined with limitations in the capabilities and capacities of member states make it very hard to really uh, implement these plans of actions. In addition, you have no legal framework that is uh, uh, totally um, synchronized across the board among the countries. There is very little enforcement cooperation um, because of the sensitivities around IU fishing. There is uh, very little information sharing between them directly. They have to get it from some other entity that, that tries to be impartial. And even if there are alternatives being promoted, such as aquaculture, uh, both inshore and onshore, still they actually have uh, their own negative impacts. 
And in the South China Sea, particularly, it's very, very problematic because it's the focal point of competing claims, environmental stress, legal contestation, and geopolitical competition. And that is all contributing to overcapacity and overexploitation in the South China Sea. So um, let me just end on a hopeful note, at least. No, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to be too negative, which I tend to be in every presentation. But uh, le let me just suggest that these three, uh, there are three things that the EU can contribute to uh, about these regional challenges. One is something that has already been raised, connection, no? connectivity. I think that uh, really there is a need to, to continue to promote connectivity indeed. But my, my idea is that it is connectivity in the sense of realizing or promoting the realization of how real and influential uh, each other's actions are in the region uh, to, to other uh, entities. So how one state's actions uh, affect the other. And also between EU and, and ASEAN, we need to be uh, able to highlight the, the connection in terms of the region's history and its future. You know? The second is with respect to integration, you know? um, integration of especially of platforms of sharing and exchange of knowledge, you know? uh, whether it's in basic information for maritime domain awareness, as was mentioned earlier, or even on advanced modeling of the regional environmental conditions, there needs to be that sharing and exchange. There are many projects such as on MDA, military modernization, law enforcement, etc. But a lot less effort is being devoted to recognizing the mutual interests and challenges uh, that these different disparate um, um, activities can be brought, uh, uh, can be can converge on and to help each other on. It's quite ironic that in an area of shared maritime space and porous uh, maritime borders, we find ourselves still trying to uh, keep away from the others no? and, and uh, find so many uh, um, obstacles and hindrances to real uh, and effective uh, cooperation. So we need to promote uh, uh, integration between these, these many between these many different nodes that are uh, of cooperation between ASEAN and other countries. We need to get them to also cooperate with each other. And lastly, uh, the point of uh, community building. I think the EU can help here because we, uh, in order to make this work, we need to promote and protect an international order that is built on cosmopolitanism, multilateralism, and peaceful dispute settlement. This was also uh, indicated er earlier. But we need this even more now because there are very visible trends uh, in the region towards populism, nationalism, and authoritarianism. We need to go back to the project of building a better world, no? uh, in a sense, help create a Southeast Asian community of nations. Uh, the threat uh, of the 21st century, ironically, is that despite the increasing integration of the world, there is a visible and increasingly vocal countervailing trend of resistance and reclusion. No? Uh, uh, this this uh, is indicated in the rise of populist leaders, the role of social media manipulation, the emergence of the so-called bubbles, uh, social media bubbles, uh, and also political opportunism by vested interests against democratic decision making and democratic societies. And I think here the EU's experience in overcoming its pre-World War II divisions and then taking the road toward unification in the present day has much uh, to say you know, uh, about ASEAN. Definitely this is not the same. The, the, uh, the tasks will not be exactly the same but the EU's experience is probably the only one that is uh, available uh, right now, which is closest uh, and most uh, parallel. No? If, it's, if there's anywhere where we can draw models or parallels from, it's probably going to be the EU and its historical experience. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Sorry if I'm talking too fast. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And it's really, really great that you raised the um, the point that the link the linkage between the climate change problem and plastic marine um, marine plastic pollution because that is exactly what we're missing in the region and also the point that the EU regional listen and ASEAN regional listen there is something in similar and also something that are different so we can discuss that further in the next session um, for now let's move to the next speaker um, Professor François Jimen. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good, good evening or good afternoon, wherever you're watching from. Um, yes, it is my pleasure to, um, to address uh, this seminar. And I would like to highlight in particular some of the concerns um, related to the impacts of climate change in the region and how military forces in the region can, can better cooperate uh, on this issue. Um, 
as you all know, um, South and Southeast Asia is clearly the region that is the most affected by the extreme climate events, uh, and in particular storms and extreme flash floods. Um, already, uh, such events induce massive displacement in the region. Most of them are internal displacement, but it is likely that in the years to come, we will observe an increasing amount of international displacement, especially as some regions and some areas of the region might become literally uninhabitable because they will be hit too frequently by uh, extreme events or because of sea level rise. Um, and therefore, the challenge upon which I would like to draw your attention today is the challenge of uh, uninhabitability. That is, to what extent will the territories of the region still be inhabitable in the future? Um, several governments of the region have already started relocation plans in order to move people from areas highly exposed to climate impacts um, to safer areas. This is the case of the Vietnamese government, which was one of the first ones to start such relocation program in the Mekong Delta. And more recently, you've probably seen that the government of Indonesia and the parliament of Indonesia have approved a plan uh, to relocate the capital city of the country, Jakarta, from the island of Java to the island of Borneo. Which means that governments in the region are already, uh, I would say, taken upon the challenge of relocating people and moving them away from harm. Yet the problem we're observing is that as of now, uh, there are still increasing number of people moving to regions highly at risk of climate impacts. Uh, if we look uh, the, evolu the demographic evolution of the regions at risk, there is an increasing number of people getting there. And the reason why there are still so many people going towards these regions rather than away from these regions is because governments and local governments in particular continue to develop housing projects, economic projects and development projects in regions highly exposed um, to climate extremes and sea level rise. And therefore, I think that there is a real risk and a real challenge here, which is about urban planning and land planning. Uh, how can we consider with a long-term view what will be the areas where people will live and the areas that where basically uh, the flood will come and areas that are likely to become uninhabitable. And I think that this requires long time planning and this requires also a lot of preparation with the inhabitants uh, in order to make sure that such relocation process do not create traumas for the inhabitants and so that they can project themselves in the future um, on a safer land. And I think this is uh, of crucial importance if we want this um, to, to go well. Uh, I think that the process that has been initiated by the government of Indonesia recently is a kind of model process because they gave themselves ample time and they anticipated a lot the effects of floods and sea level rise. And I suspect that quite many other governments in the region will need to undertake a similar relocation process. Yet, it is also one of the most densely populated regions in the world. Uh, which means that such relocation process could happen also interna in internationally. Uh, and whether such relocation will be organized by governments or spontaneous remains to be seen. Uh, but I think there is definitely a, a need of greater integration because we know very well how migration issues uh, can lead to disputes and tensions between, between countries of a similar region. Um, here I speak from Europe, uh, and Europe a few years ago was facing a dire political crisis as a result of the influx of Syrian refugees. And yet the number of Syrian refugees was relatively limited if we compare it to other massive migration flows. And yet this induced a huge political crisis that led to the departure of the UK from the European Union. And therefore my point here is to urge countries of the region to already develop collaboration and governance schemes 
so that potential migration flows related to climate change do not lead to political crisis among them. Uh, and there are lots of things that can be done for the people in order to anticipate the impacts of, of climate change. I've mentioned the relocation process, but seasonal migration schemes or bilateral migration schemes can also work in the interest of the migrants and of the country of origin and the country of destination. Um, I think it is really important, and I know that in the region, migration can also be a sensitive issue, but I think it is crucial for countries in the region to start a greater cooperation on migration. And possibly because cooperation on climate change is usually less sensitive than cooperation on migration, possibly cooperation on climate change can pave the way for a further, for a further uh, cooperation on migration and asylum issues. Clearly in the future, we will no longer be able to disentangle completely climate policies and migration policies. And yet, both policy streams have different priorities at the moment. Uh, very often, the, the priority of migration policies is to keep people where they are and to try and prevent migration and to try and avoid migration and reinforce border surveillance. On the other hand, <clears throat> when it comes to climate policies, a lot of works have shown that migration could be an adaptation solution and could be an adaptation strategy. And since the adoption of the Cancun Adaptation Framework in 2010, migration has been recognized as an adaptation strategy that can be funded through adaptation plans. And therefore, in the discussions right now at COP26 and most likely later this year at COP27, migration is recognized as an adaptation strategy that should be facilitated and encouraged. And therefore, my point here is to say that if we do not reconnect these two policy streams, there is a real risk that the policies can basically be counterproductive. If you try to prevent migration on the one hand and to facilitate it on the other hand, that cannot work. Uh, next week um, in New York, there will be the global review of uh, the migration compact. And I think that it is important that in this review, we advocate for greater connections and greater synergies with uh, the climate policies and with uh, the UN climate negotiations. And I think that we shouldn't keep these two negotiations completely separate from each other, especially in a region so densely populated, as densely populated as South and Southeast Asia, it is absolutely crucial that we reconcile migration policies and climate policies. And I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jimen. Um, just one note, I think that I agree with you that climate actions today, we focus a lot on, on mitigation measures, adaptation measures, and those adaptation measures, they are employed with the ultimate goal that that we are well adapted, then we do not have to move. We do not have to migrate. So people perceive the migration as more like the last resort. And when that happens, it means that probably we reach the tipping point, the point of no return anymore. And uh, you're right. I think at that point, maybe it's too late to, to, to consolidate a solid mechanism for it. Maybe it will be too late. That's why we need to act now. So um, thank you very much. I understand that you may have to leave before. Um, your microphone is off. Yes, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go to catch a train, but thanks a lot for the opportunity. I wish you all the best, and I hope to be able to come to Thailand in the near future, <laughs> hopefully for a live seminar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank yeah. Okay, so uh, let's move on to our last um, speaker, Dr. La Tung Kian. Your, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me express my gratitude uh, to the Research Institute on Contemporary Southeast Asia uh, to let me have the pleasure to join uh, our seminar today. And uh, as uh, you know, the uh, last speaker, uh, I believe that I should keep my uh, presentation as short as possible, but not too short, I promise. <laughs> so uh, let me go straight to the point. Um, 
I would like to raise, you know, uh, some, you know, key questions uh, on my presentation. The first big question is just why Mekong matters. Uh, the first reason is that there are more than, you know, uh, 60 million people living along the river, so the stack is very high. The second uh, reason is that the subregion is under the huge impact from the climate change. And there is a big risk of instability, not only for the Mekong subregion, but also for the Southeast Asia. Food production, for example, in the Mekong subregions matters to maritime ASEAN countries such as Philippines and Malaysia. The third reason is that as Ambassador uh, Thierry Mathieu has uh, pointed out, uh, the Indo-Pacific became the center of gravity and the Mekong, it just happens to be in the center of those Indo-Pacific. And uh, the subregions is increasingly become the hotspot of geopolitical competition. This one of the few subregions in the world that has official cooperative mechanisms from the United States, China, Japan, South Korea, India, Australia, and the prospective strong engagement from the EU and the UK to the subregion. The uh, second big question I want to raise is what is the gap of the rules based order in the subregion? So, the first gap is that we have the weak support from scientific evidence that are agreed by all riparian countries to solve the transboundary challenges in the sub-region. For example, in terms of water security, um, there's no you know, consensus on what is the key reasons uh, to the you know, water challenge in the sub-region, whether or not it is uh, upstream dams or whether it is the impact from the climate change or the impact from the economic activities of the countries. So we need more consensus. We need more scientific evidence that can you know, define the root cause of the problem. Only then can we define the correct solutions to our problems. The second gap is that there is still a lack of effective water governance mechanisms to this transboundary doubting challenges. We have, you know, about 11 cooperative me mechanisms and the Mekong River Commission uh, is the one to deal with the, you know, uh, Mekong River water, but China, Myanmar are not the member and the MRC, you know, also has a limitation uh, uh, in their functions. And someone has to fill in those gaps. And uh, the EU can play the very constructive role, which I will discuss uh, later. Now, the third big question is not what we should do, but how we do it. It is how we build up an effective transboundary water governance in the Mekong subregions. And here, uh, let me share some of our thinking. First, we need political trust and political determination. It is essential that we have the consultation platform among all six repairing countries to promote, to promote the trust and collaborations among the upper and lower stream uh, countries in, in water securities. And uh, in addition, the regional cooperation must identify the key factors that cause the water shortage to map out appropriate solution. This uh, gap that uh, I have mentioned and this approach and measures must be scientific and based on reliable data. The second point here is that it is important to have the strategic vision for the sustainable development of the Mekong subregion. And subvision should be conducive to the regional integration and prosperity, as well as in line with the socio-economic development plan and strategies of the individual six parent countries. In addition, we need to promote the central roles of ASEAN in creating the synergy between sub-regional cooperative mechanisms and ensure that sub-regional development strategies are aligned with the overall development strategies of ASEAN and ASEAN community building efforts. And in particular, it is crucial to capitalize on ASEAN centrality in advancing the dialogues, the cooperation, the confidence building in these sub-regions. And on that basis, we can 
uh, formulate and share norms of conduct, uphold the rule of law, promote mutual trust, mutual respect, and equality in the relations between and among countries in the sub-region. The third point is that it is vital to have a holistic and inclusive approach to the water security, and all stakeholders must be brought on board, including central government, local government, business, NGOs, and communities. And the Mekong repairing countries should have an abroad of the water, energy, food security methods. We cannot separate all those security issues. It has come in the comprehensive way. And uh, for example, the water security issues in the Mekong River Basin is not a standalone challenge, but it's closely linked with the reason food security and energy demand. Uh, and I want to emphasize uh, more here uh, is that in water security cooperation, the governments need to coordinate policies to uh, sharing of information uh, of the data uh, and the situation of the water discharge and water resource uh, exploitation. The first point I want to raise is that we have to allocate adequate resource of cooperation. For example, the operation of the Mekong River Commissions is largely funded by the external partners. And uh, there is a, a joke that it is not a governing body, but it is a governed body because it relies too much on the external funding. So more financial resilience of such water governing bodies must be strengthened to ensure its authority and its effectiveness. Uh, the last question is that uh, what role <laughs> the EU can play in the Mekong sub-region? And I would like to, in, uh, to inform that uh, some of you may have known that in 16 March uh, this year, our academy uh, co-hosted with the EU delegation in Vietnam to organize the EU Mekong conference, a cooperation conference, uh, in which we have reviewed the activities of the EU in the Mekong sub-regions and explore the ways ahead. And as Ambassador Daly uh, has mentioned, EU is not new to the Mekong and Southeast Asia. You have been doing you know, amazing things here. And in the future, we expect the more coherent, more comprehensive engagement of the EU to the uh, sub-region. Uh, may I raise uh, some of my you know, personal thinking? Uh, the first is that, uh, the EU can support the minilateralism in the Mekong to be the constructive building block of the broader multilateralism. So how you can do it? I think that the EU can support the Mekong issues in the ASEAN agenda. Uh, the EU can raise the Mekong issues in the uh, dialogue with ASEAN because uh, I think that the, the EU has the you know, strength and the great ability to promote dialogues. Uh, a lot among you know, different partners. Uh, the second point is that the EU can focus on the areas that uh, the EU has uh, the advantages, such as climate change adaptation, sustainable agriculture, green development, and uh, connectivity. For example, let me highlight again the transboundary water governance. I think that the EU has ab abundant experience you know, uh, in establishing soft law building norms and principles. And this is what we need in the Mekong sub-region for the more rule-based water governance. And uh, the third point is that the EU can also play the role of coordinating with other development partners, promoting the harmonizations and coordinations among development partners in uh, the sub-regions. So that's all uh, I have for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kian. Um, I think from all what I heard, the, the environmental issues, the environmental problems in the regions, um, first is all linked with the economic activities, more or less. For instance, um, when uh, Professor Baton Bacal raised the questions of plastic and plastic per pollution, Plastic industry is one of the top exports of the region. 
In ASEAN, the production and consumption of plastic grow along with the trade growth. And of course, COVID pandemic. So plastic is part of the fossil fuel supply chain and many fossil fuel companies or their subsidiaries also produce plastic raisins and products. So in Southeast Asia, petrochemical industri industries is one of the leading economic sector. So at one point, I think ASEAN faces with a dilemma between either saving the environment or the growing economic sector. And as Dr. Kian said that in how, how when we need to address the the water resources in Mekong subregion, um, we have to think what is the root cause, whether it's the blooming hydropower projects in the region that um, focus more on energy production, or it's something else. And when when we think about ASEAN, we have lots of legal texts, but but those legal texts are more like a soft laws that has no the actual en enforcement to it. So um, my question is, um, do you think that the integration of ASEAN that is more like in the softer version compared to what they have in the EU, which is a hard integration with structure, with enforcement, um, do you think that is the problem? Because if we cannot have, if we have a corporation and we have those um, diplomatic texts, but we don't have the real enforcement, then we cannot really address the problem effectively. What do you think? Yes, uh, I think your, your question is, is very important. Uh, in the Mekong sub region, actually, you know, in many your statements, you know, there are also diplomatic texts. But the key question is how we put that text into action. It's a very important question. And let's see that the situations in the water governance in the Mekong River basins. Now, is we have the asymmetric, you know, unbalanced power among the riparian countries. I think that China is, uh, you know, way too big than the uh, f five other Mekong countries. So actually we have the six riparian countries. So uh, in this situation, uh, if we, you know, uh, think of the hard law <laughs> kind of has the enforced effect, I think it is, uh, you know, uh, may not, you know, uh, feasible at this stage of development. So we have to have some, you know, widely accepted norms and principles. But you are right that how we put that norms and principles at work so that they are not just the beautiful text in the paper. <laughs> and uh, one way of doing this is that we need to create the widely consensus among you know, the academics, among the scientists, among the communities, not only among the government, so that in this uh, situation, anyone you know, violates the norms and principles will have a bad image in the public. And I believe that all countries want to have the good, you know, beautiful image in the public. You don't want to do something that everyone says that, oh, you are not a good guy. So uh, I think that the next step of, you know, uh, you know after we, we, we can establish the norms and principle, then we must have, you know, uh, the uh, wide consensus and scientific, you know, base for that norms and principle to work effectively. Thank you for sharing um, your views. Um, Professor Baton Bacal, do you want to add on top of this? Uh, yes, yes, sorry. Uh, well, only to add that, yes, you're correct that ASEAN does face a dilemma because it uh, is putting prior, placing priority, of course, on economic development and growth. And that's what the whole, uh, that's the whole point of the, uh, the ASEAN economic community. That's why, uh, that's where they're trying to put all of their efforts instead of the political security aspect. No? Uh, so that's why, that, that's also where uh, their priorities are. And yet, uh, these same uh, priorities are creating uh, these drivers for these uh, environmental problems. And as you've seen, no, uh, they, they uh, keep putting targets in place and they're simply not meeting them. 
Um, so at some point, uh, either one, one, one or the other will have to give, I think, no? And unfortunately, the current trends are not uh, are not uh, optimistic, I guess. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And also just on just a little bit to add on top of that, do you think that ASEAN way or the non-intervention approach or non-confrontational approach is still working or should we, let's say, reinterpret it in a way that we can um, foster more solid cooperation rather than just turn our back and say, okay, there's no problem, let's go on as business as usual? Well, uh, I think um, it's it's a very, very slow process, but there, I think ASEAN as a whole is probably beginning to realize that, you know, that the whole idea of non-intervention, etc. I mean, this was created in the context of the late 60s and early 70s, where the uh, problems being faced by the region was very different. No? Um, and at the time, really, um, nationalism and the need for uh, promoting national sovereignty and establishing one's uh, stability was really at, at the forefront. Uh, now, um, things have changed and the threats to stability are now very different. It's not necessarily an invasion from the next, from your neighbor, but something that threatens all of you equally. So um, uh, the, the Myanmar issue is, is one, instance I would say where uh, that that concept was as challenged uh, very recently and we saw a, a different response in a way no? although it's of course old habits die hard but I think uh, as time goes on uh, it, it will have to change in order to adjust to the demands of the new realities the only question is how quickly or how slowly that will happen yeah. whether it will catch up with the ca catastrophes we're yes. facing <laughs> and I guess that's why it's important to also start looking now at other regions in the world. You know, how did they uh, surpass uh, uh, challenges uh, uh, like this uh, and, and eventually end up building a community instead of remaining apart? You know? So that, that's why it's, it's important for us to always also be uh, looking, uh, uh, well, conversing with, with other countries uh, on these kinds of, of experiences. Yes, and I think on this point, Dr. Klein can um, jump in because in the EU, the integration, um, you already passed that point, the point of nationalism, the point that um, people are so afraid of losing sovereignty. So they do want to cooperate, but at the minimum point and don't want to anybody to interfere with the internal affairs. So the EU already passed that point. So I think um, if we can learn somewhere, we definitely can learn from the lesson of the EU. So what do you think about it? So I'm, I'm really sorry to spoil the party here and I have to put forward a bit of a contrarian uh, view on this front, I guess. Um, uh, look, I've been studying ASEAN for 20 years and the EU even slightly longer. And we've been talking about getting rid of the ASEAN way for at least as long as I can remember. And I can, um, uh, so my point has always been exactly the same. My position on this question has always been exactly the same. As soon as we get rid of the ASEAN way, and this includes non-interference, um, uh, and we will see the end of ASEAN. So I think we have to ensure, we have to make sure that we distinguish two very important concepts here, and those are logics of regionalism. ASEAN is not an imperfect version of the European Union. Okay, let us please be clear about this. Those are two very different regional integration processes, and those are born out of. Uh, political historical experiences we had. You're right that in the European Union, we have, uh, I wouldn't say we have overcome nationalism. Nationalism still plays, plays a role in, uh, in particular in, in, in some member countries. But nonetheless, you're right that we have overcome this uh, fierce guard, uh, guarding of uh, national sovereignty, right? This is, not, this is not our prime concern anymore uh, as far as the European Union is concerned. And this is a good thing. And this has, of course, uh, um, um, been... Uh, born out of our logic of regionalism, which in, in the European Union, which is um, we must overcome nationalism in order to live in peace and stability, right? Our experience with the past 500 years or so has been um, uh, whenever nationalism is strong and the nation state is strong, war is relatively likely to occur on the European continent. So out of, out of this experience, we have come to the mutual uh, uh, a conclusion that overcoming nationalism is the European way to peace and stability. 
the logic of ASEAN regionalism is very, very different. The region of ASEAN regionalism is born out of its political experiences with colonialism, external interference. Uh, 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 I remind you here of various experiences Southeast Asia had with great power interference, right? So the logic of regionalism in ASEAN is if the nation state is strong, only then the region can be strong, right? The ASEAN way is born out of the logic of regionalism that is precisely the opposite of the logic of regionalism of the European Union. We need in the European Union a weak, quote unquote, nation state in order to, and, and strong integration in order to have peace and stability. Whereas the ASEAN logic of regionalism is, we need a strong nation state, confident in our own nation building, right? In the protection of our territorial integrity and in our way of development uh, uh, in order to be strong. Only on that basis of a strong nation state are we in a position to cooperate regionally in Southeast Asia, right? So this is the essence of ASEAN regionalism and this is manifested in the ASEAN way. So mostly from Western observers, I must admit, uh, this comes to suggestion, oh, right, you must overcome consensus principle and you must overcome this non-interference. This is nonsense. I, honestly, I believe this is nonsense. This is very, very ill-advised. I think as soon as we stop uh, 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 believing in the ASEAN where we can stop believing in ASEAN, Southeast Asian integration will fall apart. Um, I, I, I think that uh, there are certain countries within ASEAN that might be more willing to move on specific issues uh, um, uh, than others. Nonetheless, we are strong as 10. We are not strong as eight, five or three, right? So uh, this is something we need to bear in mind. So mind you, on, on, on that, uh, 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 if I may add a side note here, Non-interference, for example, has never been practiced as a steadfast principle, right? I mean, there have been instances where, where ASEAN has, of course, inter interfered in, in internal countries' affairs. And, and Myanmar is, of course, the prime example, right? In the past, but also now again. I mean, what else is the five-point consensus if not interfering in, in domestic Myanmar affairs, right? Nonetheless, ASEAN tries to work on it, right? So uh, so, so I think we, we here in Southeast Asia can look at on an issue basis and can come perhaps to a um, to a specific ad hoc agreement on okay where is non-interference actually really necessary and where can we perhaps on certain issues make an exception and of course environmental issues are are, are such exceptional cases because they they affect us all and perhaps I don't want to make it a, a, a new presentation but I think this is this, this is very important to clarify different regional uh, regional projects right so I, I want to th say one thing on the Mekong because it has been discussed quite a few times I think one of the problems in the Mekong region is uh, specifically with the environment mental health of the Mekong is that ASEAN is precisely not involved, right? The, the Mekong is basically a, a, a institution, from an institutional perspective, the Mekong is basically a, a, a battlefield of minilateral approaches that do not sink, right? That do not synchronize, that do not synergize, and that uh, 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 promote a specific country's uh, strategic interest more than they promote the general health of the Mekong River, right? So I think uh, certain ASEAN member countries have to realize that the health of the Mekong is not just a mainland uh, 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 Southeast Asian problem. The health of the Mekong is something that uh, affects us all here in this region and that ASEAN really needs to needs to assume a much stronger role than they have. And here, uh, uh, my, my, my colleague from the uh, very valued institution DAV, I, I completely agree that we need to we need, we need to have ASEAN here in place to do a specific uh, set, of, uh, to set specific norms for the governance uh, uh, of the Mekong. I don't want to get into too much detail. Sorry for the lengthy answer. All right, thank you. But I still find it's interesting and very challenging to see how, um, how can we deal with the environmental problems effectively if we still, if we still hold very strong the belief of national sovereignty. Because um, let's say that each state it is um, independent in terms of sovereignty, right? They have the right to do whatever they want within their territory. But um, the world system, the world, the world ecosystem is one. It's not separated. The climate is one. We have one climate and we cannot separate that. Okay, this is my climate, this is your climate. So it's all connected. And if we cannot address that, um, it's a bit challenging. I think we have to come up with a mechanism and the way to co cooperate, um, the way maybe to go around the national sovereignty, not to make it um, an impasse for the cooperation. That's my point. And also, I would like to um, address a little bit on the core foundation values of the EU that are, well, 
that are a bit different from ASEAN. In the EU, the prerequisite of the EU is freedom, democracy, the rule of law, and also human rights protection. Um, this is articulated in the Lisbon Treaty. But um, for ASEAN, of course, these norms has been um, incorporated in ASEAN Charter. However, we, we all know that um, in reality, um, these values are sometimes limited, if not lacking, in the region. And it relates to the environmental norms integration, because um, one of the basic human rights is the right to live in a healthy environment. Um, therefore, in a state or in a region where human rights is in a more like in a promotion stage rather than protection stage. So um, environmental protection can be weakened. What do you think about it? Uh, yes, please. Yes, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ben uh, for your talking about ASEAN. Uh, your, 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 your talking is truly the ASEAN. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I can only say that I agree uh, with, you know, uh, much of what you have mentioned. May I add uh, one more point? As ASEAN, you know, I think that uh, from the beginning is not designed to be an organization to you know uh, solve the uh, you know uh, crisis and you know transboundary challenge it is not you know in design to do so and uh, also claim your right about the you know uh, national strong and the regional integrations and uh, we have that kind of view in Vietnam as well. So our view is that in order to strongly and deeply integrate into the region and the world, you have to be strong. If you are not strong, you know, <laughs> there are so many risks for you <laughs> to integrate into the region, into the world. So in our last party Congress, we have to emphasize this because our integration now came to the you know, period of you know, very deep and you know, wide uh, integration. And we had to need a very strong foundation for that. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the, the second thing is that uh, regarding the uh, uh, Mekong uh, you know, uh, water governance, uh, we have, you know, uh, heard and, you know, learned from other, you know, region experience. Uh, and the EU, uh, France has shared with us, you know, the experience of the Danube River commissions with us uh, many times. But uh, again, the uh, uh, situation is that in order to put that carb model to work, first of all, we have to look at the balance of power among the riparian countries. Uh, the situation in the Mekong subregion is much, much different. The second, it is very important to have the polit political trust. So the trust among the riparian countries is, is very important. Uh, you know, uh, the moderator has mentioned, you know, uh, the, 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 the sovereignty uh, of the riparian country. It's true that the key difference between the Mekong and South China Seas is that in the South China Sea, we have the international sea, freedom of navigation, but in the Mekong, every inch here has a sovereignty. So I think that trust is very important for the riparian countries in order to give up some of the, their sovereignty in order to uh, have the, you know, uh, corporations and uh, you know, apply some norms of the uh, equitable use of the transboundary, you know, natural resources here in the sub region. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will give the floor to the audience in case uh, there are additional questions from the audience to the panels. I believe we have um, a 
Kun Apichai, would you like to share your view? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I've actually typed it in my in the chat box, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Lei has also responded. But then my, my question is, he said that, well, uh, it has been shared quite a number of times. Right? I, I was encouraging that uh, maybe EU should share its experiences of its transboundary man, uh, management of its transboundary rivers, like the Rhine or the Danube, yeah? Which, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's the same kind of similar type of issue. Of course, uh, Europe takes a maybe somewhat different, uh, you know, a kind of approach, uh, just like uh, what you, uh, Kitinat, has said, uh, that, that they have different norms, different values and things. Um, but I also quite agree with what Frederick was saying, you know. Um, you know, the one of the ASEAN, former ASEAN and the late Dr. Serena, Secretary General, you know, he was often asked by reporters, you know, is ASEAN going to be like EU? And his answer was, EU is our inspiration, but not our model. Okay, very simple, All right? And I think that basically encapsulates the difference, the main difference between EU and ASEAN. And if you try to ask ASEAN to mold into the EU kind of uh, you know, thing, then you will break, <laughs> just like what Frederick was saying. Uh, and then the next day, immediately, you know, <laughs> I don't think you will survive very long. So uh, we might have to try a little bit of flexibility here, uh, maybe over time with a bit of nudging here, there, uh, maybe some of the you know, more, shall we say, uh, countries that would like to move a little bit towards less sovereignty, you know, uh, averse and more sort of cooperation integration. Uh, I mean, after all, you know, ASEAN, in the, even in the ASEAN Charter, does have this uh, minus X principle, yeah? If you look at it, there is a minus X principle, but it's only for the economic sector. And only if all 10 member countries agree to use the minus X, okay? All right, so there's a, a bit of caveats, a few caveats here. But it's not to say that ASEAN does not use minus X. <laughs> it can use minus X, but all have to be willing to, 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 to agree to it and to allow it and then in other words, the minus X meaning, okay, those countries who want to wish to go forward faster uh, or whatever, more, you know, uh, uh, and go ahead, uh, as long as it doesn't, you know, alter the, the basic principles or the norms too much or something like that. Uh, so we might have to look at this a little bit more. Uh, I mean, there's has been some uh, discussion within ASEAN on some of these, you know, whether, you know, because the charter has also been already more than 10 years old, right? Uh, and it maybe needs to a little bit of revision, right? And things have changed as we all know. Uh, so, uh, and I guess this minus X is also one wonderful thing uh, that perhaps, anyway, there, there's a high level panel now in ASEAN, they're looking at the post 2025 vision. So propose to them, you know, tell them that uh, maybe it's time to suggest some new modes of modalities of, you know, operation, let's put it that way. Huh? We need to change our SOPs a little bit because of Ukraine, because of COVID, and you know, and then later on, who knows what next will be coming? Climate change, biodiversity, antimicrobial resistance. You know, how are you going to deal with all these different multiple uh, threats that are going to occur? You know, either simultaneously or, or one after the other. You know, are we resilient enough? Huh? Like just like one of the office, one of the speakers was saying, uh, how resilient you have to be <laughs> to withstand all this. I mean. Okay, frankly speaking, you know, uh, even Europe or even the developed countries are not so resilient. <laughs> Thank you to say. Uh, but some are more resilient than others, obviously. So, uh, yeah, in order to address many of these uh, uh, transnational threats uh, these days, uh, you have to, well, then you have to go back to the West Westphalia Agreement, which has created the nation state <laughs> or even the UN, you know. Can you can you do away with the P5 in the UN, for example? You know, I'm in favor of you know, P5 is an anachronistic, uh, you know, uh, it's way, you know, old fashioned. It's only the post-World War II kind of thing. Now it's already, you know, no longer, you know, I mean, after all, look, you know, uh, Russia is a P5 and China is a P5. So 
<laughs> and can we can we go on like this? You know, so I don't know. Uh, that that will require a revolution, a global revolution. But I don't know whether that's possible. <laughs> maybe maybe in our own minds, yes. But <laughs> not so sure whether many. I think the key is that we have to strike the right balance between effective enforcement and then some flexibility. Yeah. So we can adapt to the, um, sure. the to the threats that we're facing, and also to keep our identity as the regional organization. Um, okay, I think um, that is it for today. Thank you very much for your contributions and for for sharing your knowledge and your perspectives today. So thank you very much. We're, I'm going to give the floor back to Eric for the. Uh, thank you very much, Kitinut, or merci. Hein? I know so you can speak uh, perfectly French as well. Uh, thanks to uh, the speaker, of course, and um, also uh, our colleague from the audience for, for the, the question and uh, the comments. Uh, without further ado, uh, I think it's time for um, Dr. and uh, Prof. Alès to conclude. So uh, Delphine is a university professor in political science and the director as well of the International Relations Department uh, at INALCO. INALCO is a famous university in France for languages and civilizations. Her research focuses on Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia. She knows she speaks uh, Bahasa, and also on uh, non-Western approaches to the international cooperation. Please, Prof. Alès Delphine, uh, the floor is yours to conclude. Merci, Eric. Many thanks. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to close uh, and try to wrap up the, the discussions. It's a huge challenge uh, to try to summarize such a rich afternoon uh, or morning and afternoon here in, uh, in Romania uh, of um, discussions. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank you very much uh, at uh, IRASEC for organizing this uh, fruitful exchange between practitioners and scholars of the Indo-Pacific. It was really great uh, listening to all of you and also to see friendly faces uh, or names uh, on the screen. So what I will try to do uh, for the next um, uh, few minutes is I will not repeat, of course, whatever, uh, whatever I have heard uh, during the two panels, but I'll try to share some of the transversal reflections uh, that came to my mind as I was listening to um, all the presentations uh, from the ambassadors first and uh, then uh, from uh, all the um, uh, uh, panelists uh, on the two um, panels. So the, the general theme of the workshop was uh, focusing on the idea of a new uh, regional order in the Indo-Pacific. And indeed, I would like to stress uh, maybe three areas of novelty in the European and Asian approaches to this uh, strategic concept from what uh, I have heard uh, through uh, the um, uh, panels and presentations. So the first area I would like to uh, stress is the convergence um, on the recognition that uh, indeed the Indo-Pacific forms a coherent and multidimensional strategic, but also a political uh, space. It is very striking to me today that, um, well, until recently, most workshops uh, about the Indo-Pacific would start you know, with a discussion about uh, the relevance of the concept, about its novelty, about whether it would stick around for a long time or dissolve uh, like the form of the sea, to paraphrase uh, uh, Chinese um, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi. And, what was very interesting to me today uh, is to see that this discussion did not happen uh, uh, today, uh, neither on the part of our practitioners nor on the part of our scholars. And that is because indeed the um, uh, increased level of intensity of the informal institutionalization uh, of the region and the intensification of uh, policy of, of concrete policy initiatives that are predicated on the Indo-Pacific context has given it the political substance that uh, it was still lacking a couple of years ago when it was only used uh, in um, a high level strategic um, doctrine. So it's very interesting to see that uh, there is this convergence on the fact that the Indo-Pacific does exist um, and uh, is, uh, uh, has a degree of uh, political substance. The second um, uh, point, which uh, perhaps uh, is one of these new uh, um, observations, uh, is this uh, uh, emergence of a new uh, work method between Europeans and uh, Asian partners, especially um, ASEAN, a new work method which is predicated on mutual recognition at uh, the political and diplomatic 
levels in contrast with what we used to have, which was a rather top-down or leadership-based um, uh, European approach uh, towards uh, cooperation with uh, Asia and especially uh, Southeast Asia. There used to be, um, uh, um, I mean, there is a, a very striking uh, turn, which was already clear in the uh, EU's Indo-Pacific uh, strategy and which was further reinforced with the February um, uh, forum uh, in Paris, which enhanced the importance of co-elaborated uh, objectives, which enhanced uh, this need for a cooperation that is committed to realize the ASEAN Indo-Pacific uh, strategy in terms of uh, contributing, for instance, to uh, connectivity uh, in the region. And the fact that um, uh, for us, such as the, the Paris uh, Forum may become a working method, uh, setting the path for further similar high-level uh, dialogues between um, Asian and European partners is very promising in terms of enhancing common objectives and outlooks between the two regions, working as partners um, uh, in, uh, on, on shared um, uh, objectives. Um, the third point I would like to uh, stress on perhaps a more substantial um, uh, terms is the fact that I found very interesting today that uh, most of our speakers demonstrated uh, that there is a continuum between so-called conventional uh, security matters and so-called non-traditional security uh, matters. Uh, scholars of security or strategic studies uh, have long, uh, long known and shown that uh, the division between traditional security and non-traditional security was uh, artificial. It's especially obvious for whoever studies uh, Asian security doctrines uh, or current matters, but um, in the context of um, discussions about the Indo-Pacific, there is still very commonly a separation between um, the ideas that some actors like the United States, for instance, have been focusing on more conventional or military oriented uh, approaches um, to the regions, while others like the European Union uh, are more deemed to have a so-called softer approach uh, focused on non-state or non-military uh, threats. And I think that our two roundtables today were very interesting in showing that the two approaches cannot be disconnected uh, in the region, that uh, challenges in terms of environmental security and maritime security um, completely mix uh, conventional and, and so-called non-traditional security uh, issues, and that um, the changes in the global or regional strategic uh, environment will have clear repercussions on all aspects uh, of human and uh, environmental security. And the reverse, of course, uh, is also true. Uh, environmental security matters do have very concrete uh, traditional uh, security um, consequences, which means uh, that the European approach uh, focused on so-called non-traditional security should not be seen as an expedient, but as a contribution to an essential aspect of uh, the challenges faced uh, in the in the region. So that's uh, the three um, uh, points of novelty that I wanted to stress. Now, of course, there are uh, challenges uh, that remain to be addressed in order to perhaps move forward in changing um, uh, uh, the uh, approach uh, in the uh, 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 I mean, the common uh, uh, Asian and European approach to, towards the, uh, Euro, uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, um, the first challenge I would like to, to stress uh, is the question of the meaning of words. Um, as I said at the beginning, there is no longer a discussion about the Indo-Pacific context per se, or about the relevance uh, of or the, the, uh, the, the, the re relevance of this region uh, as a political and strategic uh, space. But the notions behind uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific remain challenged, especially when it comes to transforming principles into practices. And it is especially the case about the notion of multilateralism, which uh, has been uh, used by many of our speakers uh, today. And what is always striking to me is the fact that we all agree that multilateralism is desirable, uh, that there is a need for uh, more multilateral cooperation, etc., for a rules-based international um, order. It's widely plebiscited by all actors uh, in the region, but at the same time, uh, all actors have uh, their own view about what is or what should be multilateralism. And the current crisis uh, in uh, Ukraine and also the potential crisis in the Indo-Pacific uh, region show that 
there is a variable geometry uh, of this uh, notion of multilateralism and especially of the commitments that uh, it involves. We saw that uh, votes at the United Nations uh, General Assembly and especially at the UN uh, Human Rights Council uh, have shown that the norms that the uh, European Union's uh, states sees as being a prominent part of a rules-based uh, international order, maybe these rules are seen as secondary to the safeguarding of a hardly won autonomy uh, by states uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, maybe even Indonesia, who is committed uh, to international um, stability. So there is still a long way for Europeans to recognizing that um, even when there is convergence on specific values, on specific agendas, uh, on specific policy objectives, well, the implicit uh, norms and commitments that are placed by Europeans behind the notion of uh, safeguarding the liberal international order, maybe uh, these norms and commitments are only one among many approaches to what um, the international order should be. And the urgency is um, perhaps to build governance rules that are truly seen as global and that are not challenged, rightly or wrongly, as being uh, European-based um, uh, norms. And this is a challenge which is of particular importance in the current um, context, because the war in Ukraine is very often presented and perceived from the point of view of Southeast Asian public opinions as a struggle against the Western-ruled international um, uh, order, which it is not, but this perception cannot be overcome without drastic changes um, uh, to favor a more inclusive multilateral um, uh, cooperation. So the Indo-Pacific experiences, very interestingly, can be a laboratorium for this since uh, the Indo-Pacific is geographically centered on Southeast Asia and institutionally much closer to the ASEAN way uh, of multilateral cooperation. So I think we are on the right path towards building uh, this uh, more global, more inclusive international order. The Indo-Pacific is a way uh, forward, but it takes a lot of adaptation uh, on the part of Europeans to change their outlook uh, on this regard. Finally, and uh, as another challenge, I also noticed and it was very interesting to hear the discussions about the insistence on the need um, to enhance mutual recognition at the people-to-people -people level, in addition to the existing progress uh, that have been made at the political and diplomatic um, levels. And I think it also works both, way, uh, both ways. Politi pop popular um, uh, recognition is indeed an important challenge uh, for the further implementation of trans-regional uh, initiatives. Uh, it is true, it was mentioned that um, the evocation of the EU uh, provokes a shrug uh, in Indonesia, but I'm also pretty sure that the evocation of ASEAN provokes either a shrug or perhaps even not any uh, reaction uh, at all for most European citizens. So the spread of a better knowledge uh, uh, about both regions, uh, their singular history and also uh, of the shared security and political challenges, um, this is an essential part of legitimizing the common initiatives uh, that are being undertaken, and uh, it's an important part also in uh, building the civil society basis that is necessary for the sustainability in the long um, uh, run of these um, shared uh, Indo-Pacific uh, initiatives. So these are many, um, of course, uh, steps uh, ahead, and uh, I only gave a few uh, uh, hints uh, based on what I heard today. I would just like to uh, close the uh, uh, the session and uh, these uh, comments by again thanking uh, all of the speakers for their excellent presentations and um, discussions, which I think have highlighted some very concrete aspects uh, to this new Indo-Pacific order and uh, path for more European-ASEAN uh, convergence on regional and uh, global multilateral governance. Thank you, Ray. Thank you very much, Delphine, for this uh, fascinating uh, views. And also, thank you for your very kind effort uh, to, to be uh, with us uh, today, this morning. Very much appreciated. Uh, so this concludes our um, seminar and this uh, discussion. So before closing this uh, too long uh, session, uh, maybe let me thank uh, all of our participants, of course, uh, the speakers uh, across the Indo-Pacific, uh, the moderators uh, as well, uh, audience as well for the question, and including also our uh, ambassadors, Ambassador Matu, Ambassador Dali, Ambassador Peno, and Ambassador uh, Vizentin. 
thanks a lot, as you said, to the organizer, Antoine from Alliance Française, and of course, last but uh, certainly not least, uh, uh, Irasek, Christine, and uh, Jérôme, and uh, also the French Embassy in uh, Bangkok, for sure. Thanks a lot, and uh, hopefully uh, to be continued uh, soon. And first, it will be uh, online soon to uh, be back on this uh, discussion. Uh, thank you very much.